Well, welcome, everybody. Um, my name is Joe Jameson from the U.S. Peace Council. And uh, tonight we have uh, an interesting lineup of uh, uh, presentations, including an, uh, an outstanding peace activist, Joy Hall. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. I'm shaky. My Korean's a little shaky. But uh, who is our main speaker tonight. But we have some other interesting uh, things, too. Um, in a minute, I will introduce uh, the, the Raging Grannies, who will sing a song. But let me just uh, announce two uh, upcoming conferences that uh, a lot of uh, left and progressive organizations are involved in. Uh, one of them is um, a, a conference uh, on uh, the 100th anniversary of the Russian Revolution, the Bolshevik Revolution. And uh, Professor Manny Ness, who's over there, uh, has, has flyers on it. It's on November 7th, uh, free and open to the public. And uh, wor uh, Workers World Party and just about every left group in New York is supporting it. Very ecumenical uh, event. So uh, please take a flyer. The other uh, event, uh, which I want to uh, mention to you, uh, and Bauman, who's in the back there, has this is on. Uh, this created a, 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 a U.S. Co a coalition to shut down U.S. foreign bases, of which there are about 900. Uh, so it's a massive task, and uh, we're involving peace forces from around the world. That conference, that launch conference, is in January in Baltimore. Uh, please take a flyer and, uh, and uh, attend if you can, or support in some way. Um, I want to thank the International Action Center for hosting us tonight, and uh, they were very generously uh, donated the space. And before I, we hear from the Raging Grannies, I just want to mention all the groups. Uh, this is another ecumenical event, just about every peace group, group thankfully, recognizing the uh, urgency of the Korean situation, sponsored this uh, Global Network Against Weapons and Nuclear Power in Space, No Dut Dol. Of, uh, for Korea, it's a Korean American progressive organization for community development. The International Action Center, where we are tonight, the U.S. Peace Council, the Granny Peace Brigade, the Catholic Workers, the Veterans for Peace, New York City chapter, uh, Peace Action, New York State, U the UNAC, the United National Anti-War Coalition, and Brooklyn for Peace. I hope I'm not leaving anybody out, but that uh, that's a very uh, broad coalition of. Uh, U.S. anti-war groups, and it's a recognition of the uh, urgency of the issue. Um, let me just introduce now the, the Raging Grannies, who will treat us to a song. Uh, they are the folks with the hats. <laughs> These are the Raging Grannies. We'd like you to sing along with us. We left song sheets on your chairs. We're just doing no military bases. We have military bases at home and all around. In old Peru and Timbuktu, wherever there is ground. In over 80 countries, and in every case, what do they give us? Another base. There is nothing like a base, nothing in this world. And we have them every place, we will soon have them up in space. In over 80 countries, on every continent, on the land we occupy, their people don't consent. In Turkey and the Philippines, in South Korea too, Whatever we do there, we must undo. There is nothing like a base, nothing in this world. And we have them every place, we will soon have them up in space. 797 foreign bases plus. We dominate these countries, they fear and don't want us. Let the U.S. people know our bases we must yield. We only want our bases on a baseball field. 
There is nothing like a base, nothing in this world. And we have them every place, we will soon have them up in space. Thank you for the Raging Grannies. Okay, uh, I'd just like to call up uh, Sarah Flounders, who, along with uh, Julian Ri, has been a key organizer of this event. Uh, Sarah, to welcome people to the International Action Center. Uh, just to really give a special and warm welcome here tonight. I think everyone who came uh, tonight and all across the country and in every poll, overwhelming, the overwhelming majority of the population in the U.S. today is both apprehensive and very opposed to another war. But there's so much more that they need to know. And that is part of this meeting and part of this tour. Uh, what's, what's too often forgotten? And so I just want to touch on a couple of those what's forgotten. More than 5 million Korean people died in the U.S. war on Korea. That's something we can never forget and shapes all of history. Shapes everything today, along with the constant unending U.S. war games. Now, we're going to see a, a PowerPoint that gives so much a sense of history, but there, and so there's some fact sheets that we're also passing around. U.S. troops have occupied South Korea since 1945, and there's still 28,000 troops there. 38 U.S. military installations, and one militarized golf course. <laughs> What's yes. on this militarized golf course? It's a station for the THAAD, that's Thermal High Altitude Area Defense Battery Missiles. That's what's on this militarized golf course. And part of what we're doing today is also talking about these THAAD missiles, talking about the constant nuclear overflights, talking about the unending threats on the people of Korea, and our call, which is to sign the peace treaty. Let the people of Korea live in peace, live united in peace. That's a basic human demand. It's a demand for national sovereignty. And it's a demand that the people here in the U.S. really can also understand. That we don't need endless billions, trillions for war. We need it right here for people's needs. They can talk about militarization in Korea and they can't provide emergency relief in Puerto Rico. And that is just how desperate the situation is today. So thank you so much for everyone who's here today. And, and we also want to spend time at the end of the meeting talking about some very important uh, next steps. And, and for even a few of you who can stay after to plan this actively, I think we're going to do that too. So that at each step, we're planning a next step. Thank you. Um, uh, we have our PowerPoint presentation now, and I'd like to introduce uh, J.T. Takagi. Am I pronouncing that right? Takagi? Okay. Uh, J.T. is an Asian-American activist and independent filmmaker whose films include several on uh, issues in the Korean Peninsula. She teaches at the City College of New York and the School of Visual Arts, and she works with Third World Newsreel an alternative progressive uh, media center. Takagi, JT Takagi works with the Korea Policy Institute, a progressive think tank, and the national campaign to end the Korean War, as well as local New York community groups. So would you please welcome JT. I'm a first disclaimer, not an expert, but, um, and this is the result of work of several people at NOSCO. Um, we're presenting it because amongst all the kind of news, even uh, progressives are, I think, being misled a lot by the misinformation out there about 
why things are happening and um, the focus is on, oh, this person just coming out of the blue, these nuclear tests are out of the blue and nothing is out of the blue. They're all based in uh, historical issues that um, started way back. So we thought we would do a little um, presentation on that history. Um, it's ultra brief and now having seen that it's a small screen, uh, you probably have a hard time reading it. So I'm going to read it for you really fast. But uh, can anyone see it though? Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, so. Can everyone hear JT? Is it, is it okay. So um, the ultra brief starts with 1945. There's of course an earlier history where uh, US was involved, but we're going to start with the end of the World War II and Korea being divided. And I think even most Americans don't really realize that there was one Korea. Um, and it hasn't been that long that that was the case. Um, also, most people don't realize that it was the US that made the decision to cut at 30 parallel. Um, and the US complied, at the, the USSR complied at the time, and that was supposedly just to accept surrender. But in fact, at that point, the US was al already embarking on uh, its fight against communism. And um, so with the division, Korea's liberated for like a month. And uh, at 19th, in August 15, 1945, US troops come in. Um, and you have a civil war brewing in the country itself, because as soon as people were liberated from Japanese occupation, I hope people understand that before 45, Japan had occupied Korea 35 years. Under horrendous conditions, people were forced to lose their language. All their, um, all the work and people were being taken out of the country, forced to work in mines, it's had the comfort woman issue, the military sexual slavery, all these terrible things were happening. There's a liberation and then all of a sudden, occupation again. Meanwhile though, people, peasants all across the country were forming people's committees, beginning to organize for a new, new country. Um, and only to have that circumvented by U.S. Um, oppression. Um, I'm going to jump right to uh, 1950, where you already have civil war brewing, but you also have the U.S. Um, had managed to bring in and establish the so-called puppet government, um, Sigmund Rhee in the south, and in the north, um, you have Kim Il-sung coming into power. Um, by 48, you have establishment of two countries, supposedly, and, uh, and there's still fighting going on. The oppression in the South is getting worse in terms of anyone who is, includes um, workers unionizing, uh, people's committees, people are getting thrown into jail, getting massacred. There's huge massacres. Um, and uh, you have, the, when people say the um, North invaded, Actually, at that point, in 1950, the fighting was going on along the border for quite a while, and either side could have started the war, and it would have happened probably in any case because of the tensions between the different parties involved in well, groups wanting a unified country and groups that were supporting one side or the other. Um, so you have this war. U.S. almost immediately gets the U.N., to, which was very new at that time, to back it as coming in as a police action to save the South. Um, and very quickly, uh, you have China having to enter because the US, when they finally get in and they start moving up, they go past 38 parallel, and MacArthur begins to think that he can actually go into China. They talk about using atom bombs. Um, China has no choice but to enter to support the North. The fighting goes on, but actually you find even though the war starts in 1950, by 1951, things are pretty much stalemated, and people are just dying. Uh, by the end of the war, the so-called end of the war, in 53, 90% of North Korea has been completely demolished by U.S. carpet bombing. Um, and so they literally, when the North talks about having to rebuild from the ashes, they're really being truthful about that, because there was almost nothing left. Both sides are devastated, but North totally, totally devastated. Um, when the fighting ends in 53, it's an armistice, which means it's a temporary halt to fighting. So at that point, the war is not over, and the war is still not over now. Um, 
There was a plan in the armistice to negotiate for a peace treaty and the removal of foreign troops was supposed to happen and did not. Okay. <laughs> so in this really brief, ultra, ultra brief past history, I'm going to go through 1950s to 70s. The U.S. Oh, I don't know if the computer's um, The U.S. continues to main troops and bases in South Korea and secretly installs nuclear weapons um, and only admits to, have to them existing when they removed them in 1991. Um, North Korea rebuilds itself and develops quickly in this time period and um, it by 1960 starts civilian nuclear research with support from the Soviet Union and builds the Yongbyon Nuclear Research Complex. It joins the IAEA, the International Atomic Energy Agency, for peaceful nuclear activity in 1974. The U.S. is in this McCarthy mode, and you find that as soon as the fighting of the war ends, the U.S. is already embarking on sanctions and doing everything it can to make it not possible for the North to develop, not possible for it to trade. Um, and this whole time period, from that point up to now, this has been a constant U.S. policy. So it's not, all the sanctions that are being placed on now are, are just added upon sanctions that had already been placed on the country. Um, Here, um, the basic U.S. approach to North Korea. Is it out of order? But anyway, okay. Uh, this is a quote from Jeffrey Bader, who was the former director of East Asian Affairs at the White House. Um, and he wrote about Obama's first term in the presidency. Um, and I'd say that this quote pretty much sums up U.S. approach to North Korea all, this, all these decades. It says here, many of us believe that the most likely long-term solution to the North nuclear pursuits lay in the North's collapse and absorption into a South-led reunified Korea. A strategy was still needed to slow down, freeze, and degrade the North Korean program until history could take its course. And you'll notice that the U.S. policy on throughout this period, besides sanctions and strangulation of North Korea, was an assumption that in fact it would collapse and so why bother to follow through on any of the agreements that it had um, embarked upon? So it was to halt, supposed to halt, to halt North Korea's nuclear program, while North Korea's aim throughout this period was to have a fundamental change in U.S. policy for it to stop concerning North Korea, an enemy state. And the North Korea has demanded, in exchange for halting its nuclear program, security assurance and normalization of relations. That desire hasn't changed throughout this time period. Um, I don't know, if some people in this room probably recall this time period um, in the 1990s when um, there was, in fact, we were very, very close to war. Um, in, under Clinton in 93, and this was after a whole period of time where um, North had embarked on nuclear work. Um, the uh, U.S. and the IAEA had decided, oh, that in fact, that this nuclear development wasn't just for peaceful purposes and was demanding very intrusive inspection capabilities. Um, and this led to a standoff because in every time there's discussion of inspection, the kind of inspections that um, all the other parties are asking for are ones that no one else would agree to and that we would examine everything you have and then decide whether or not you're complying with this. Um, especially when you're talking about a country that is still doesn't have any guarantee of peace, right? Because there's no peace treaty. So we're li living basically in a situation of a war and being asked to show what we have in order to be able to achieve peace. It doesn't make any sense. So we came close in 1903, Clinton, um, under President Clinton, there was talk of sending bombers um, and it was only with uh, former President Jimmy Carter finally making a trip over to the north and talking to Kim Il-sung that there's a possibility of negotiation and they come up with what's called the agreed framework. And then under the agreed framework, outside parties, so the U.S., Japan, South Korea, were also participate in providing light water nuclear reactors to the north um, and aid and in return, the North would undertake to dismantle and stop its nuclear activity. Um, what you find in this case 
and the, all the six party talks that followed after that is that the U.S. and its allies keep finding reasons that things are not being, their conditions are not being met so they won't fulfill their obligations. But if you think about in terms of the U.S. general policy, which is don't do anything because things are going to collapse, it all sort of links up. But they didn't deliver those light water reactors. Um, thinking, oh, we don't have to because in '94, people sun passes away, so the U.S. Get, gets in the mode of, oh, things are going to go. We'll just wait, and it will collapse. Will happen, and we'll be all right. Um, and of course, it doesn't. And that is like the sort of makes no sense policy of uh, not negotiating, just holding off, <coughs> hoping things will happen, and not taking new cap. But in fact. Um, I think the U.S. assumption is that everything's led by one person, and so if that person goes, the country can't survive. Clearly, that's not the case, because the country has managed to survive, and in fact, the North position is, we've had sanctions before, we've been under war situations before, none of this is going to make force us to collapse, it's going to make us work harder for what we want. And so far, at least, the U.S. hasn't come to the realization that it doesn't make sense to keep going in the mode that they're going. Um, among the things that uh, impacted things was the, of course, the, for North Korea, was the collapse of the Soviet Union. And that sort of exacerbated a lot of their situation because you consider they've been under sanctions all this time anyway. But with the collapse of the Soviet Union, now their greatest trading partners are out of the picture um, and even China is asking for a lot of cash instead of just subsidies and help. So it puts North into a very precarious position, but not an impossible one. As they said, they've had to suffer this before. Um, so they were under worse economic conditions, they have shortages of fuel and food, and then a series of national, national disa natural disasters in the mid-90s that leads to millions, po possibly millions, has away from the food shortages, um, but that still doesn't stop them. At the same time this is happening, the U.S. is increasing its uh, ambitions in the Pacific area. It creates a so-called nuclear umbre umbrella where the U.S. nukes are supposed to protect South Korea and Japan, um, and uh, it's bringing in B-1 bombers and other nuclear-capable weapons in its annual war games, so that it's um, the U.S., if anything, is increasing its uh, hostile aggression against the North. Um, okay, I'll do this. Oh, just this whole issue of the, the potential war in 1994, the projection that the Pentagon had projected that one, mil one million deaths, including 100,000 Americans residing in South Korea, would occur if, in fact, the U.S. went to war. And that was something, though, that they were they calculated and were prepared to take on, which is insane. Um, okay, so and this this is just details of that agreed framework, where the young reactor was going to be frozen. They would like allow IAEA inspection and dismantle nuclear reactors by 2003. But the U.S. was supposed to build light water reactors to build to deliver an annual supply of 500,000 tons of fuel and move towards full normalization. All right, while well, this is happening, the South is also undergoing big changes, right? So um, you, I'm, I'm assuming, perhaps wrongly, that most people in the room understand that, that South Korea had been under military dictatorship for decades and decades. And um, finally, when in 1987, you have the People's Revolution, basically, that begins to overturn that situation. And um, under Kim Dae-jung, who's in there from 1998 to 2003, um, you have the sunshine policy where, in fact, the, the South begins to realize that, um, not realize that, at least the presidency and the parties and leadership of the South realize that it's time to actually begin to open relations with the North. And you begin to see um, things like economic zones being formed, uh, separated families of which there were like 10 million families who had been separated since the Korean War with no contact in all that time. They were beginning to have meetings and things like that. And this uh, this was a result of the June 15th 
North-South Declaration in 2000, um, which also led to the formation of various diasporic Korean groups all over the world forming supportive June 15 committees, and they're still in existence today. So there's agreement to bilateral talks and activities, and it sort of forced the U.S. in the position of having to um, also soften somewhat. And so you have the interesting situation where towards the end of Clinton's presidency, there is actually movement to possibly have a chance of negotiations and normalization. Um, and there was a U.S. DPRK joint communique in October 2000. Madeleine, Madeleine Albright goes there. Um, but by November, um, we have a new president. And then everything just disappears. Um, in this communicate, by the way, both sides said that neither government would have hostile intent toward the other and confirmed the commitment of both governments to make every effort in the future to build a new relationship free from past enmity. Um, when Bush comes in, things get worse, and he and reneges on all past agreements. In his 2002 State of the Union draft, he referred to the axis of evil. Um, and includes North Korea and that. Um, and then 2002 nuclear posture review, they say that new North Korea would be a potential target of nuclear strike. Um, you have the largest ever South Korea-US military exercise at, in 2002. And then 2003 US invades Iraq. So you see a building militarization um, in on the side of the US. And in response to this, North Korea withdraws for the NPT, the Nuclear Proliferation Treaty, which everyone's supposed to, in that treaty, um, right, only the five countries that have nu nuclear weapons get to keep them and everyone else can't, which also I'm gonna say, doesn't seem to make a lot of sense anyway. <laughs> but, um, and they restart the nuclear reactors and produce an plutonium for six to ten nuclear bombs. Um, and I have to wrap this up. So, <laughs> You have a whole series of six-party talks which attempt to um, open up negotiations around this disarmament. Um, you have a 2005 and then 2000 later, 2007 joint agreement over where the U.S. pledges not to attack or invade DPRK with nuclear conventional weapons. But in fact, none of this comes to anything. Um, and then in 2006, you have North Korea realizing that nothing was going to happen already the U.S. had not delivered the light water reactors that were promised in the, in the uh, 1994 agreement. And so they begin to uh, announce nuclear tests. There's more sanctions. This is on Japan and Australia joins. So basically, under Obama, we had what he called strategic patience, which is, follows in the line of the same thing of hoping things if you, if you strangle the country enough by economic sanctions and hostile military activity around it, then it will collapse. And um, so it's, if anything, though we had great hopes when Obama came into office that, because he had said he would be willing to talk to North Korea without preconditions, that never happened during his administration. And in fact, things intensified under his administration. Um, and they start developing these plans for potential invasion, occupation, and counterinsurgency in the North. Um, and you have this whole, what they were terming the pivot to Asia, where it, U.S. seeing that that's the place to be, and they decided they would have control over most of it. So you begin to have, and a lot of that, of course, is aimed at China, but for all of this, North Korea becomes a very convenient target of, without saying so you don't have to talk about China so much, so you just talk about North Korea. Okay. Um, and I'm gonna wrap this up. So you have, in uh, at a certain point, in actually both in 2012 and again in this year, North Korea basically says, nothing is going on with this negotiating stuff. And uh, we might as well prepare ourselves for the possibility of war. And that's essentially where they're on, on the route of now, because the U.S. keeps saying, oh, we're, we're ramping up our forces, but we still imagine maybe diplomacy is possible. At the same time, Trump is saying, oh, uh, the, why waste time talking? Um, and North being aware that this is 
This is not helpful to anything. The basic thing is, right, why would you negotiate away your capability to have nuclear power if you have no guarantee that you'll have be safe once you do that? So they look at the case of Libya and they realize, oh, this is like not a good thing. So that um, we believe that the U.S. has to see that they have to change their policy. And until that happens, North Korea is no longer interested in talks and says it will prepare for war. Um, so North Korea has continued to test satellite launches. And in the summer of 2017, tested ICBM launches. Um, with one able to reach the U.S. mainland. Um, it says it could hit near Guam, and as of September 3rd, completed its sixth nuclear test of a purported new hydrogen bomb. Trump, in the meantime, has increased military spending. He says he'll do it by many billions of dollars, and claims that North Korea will be met by fire and fury, the likes of which the world has never seen, and that talking is not the answer. Um, and part of this thing is not appearing, so I am unable to show um, this whole PowerPoint. But basically, we believe that the only way forward is diplomacy. The U.S. has to take the position that it's willing to talk before it demands the demilitarization of North Korea. Um, and we think that Korean Americans and all Americans have to take the responsibility to demand that the U.S. do this because it's not hasn't been on anyone's radar till very recently, mostly because now people are scared, and rightfully so. And then, so this is the moment that people have to say, going to war is crazy. People will die. Millions have died before, and they will continue to die unless people here say, we don't want to spend billions of dollars on more weaponry in the peninsula. We, we want peace. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Jay Fields. Good round of applause for Jay Fields. Very good presentation. Um, I'm now going to introduce our main speaker tonight, Joya Cole, but can I get uh, Julian to come up here? Because uh, I can give the, uh, the official intro, but Julian knows quite a few other facts about our main speaker tonight, who is getting to be better known as a major peace figure. He's been in, uh, touring the U.S., uh, arriving two weeks ago in Maine, and then heading to Boston and uh, New Haven, and now he's in New York, and he heads back to his homeland tomorrow. Uh, Joy Cole is an anti-war activist and musician. He's been at the forefront of local villager struggles to stop the expansion of U.S. military bases, to shut down South Korea's Jeju Island naval base, and to prevent the installation of the THAAD missiles, which enable a first strike. Uh, also, he's involved in conserving marine life. And he's here to help us tonight to discuss a sustainable peace in Korea and the Korean people's struggle against militarism in East Asia at this time of Trump's threats of nuclear war. So I'm going to ask Julian to amplify on that introduction. I think that's a that's a quite an introduction. I don't think uh, we, I really need to add more. We first met him um, through the Pyongyang uh, struggle. I'm not sure if you guys know, but uh, U.S. decided to expand the Pyongyang. Uh, there's an Osan Air Base, and they decided to make it multiplex, really nice, luxurious uh, base. So they, in order for them to build a golf course and 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 other uh, amenities, they evicted the entire village and demolished it, actually. And then now there's nothing um, on the ground. On that, uh, US, a lot of people who were doing a peace and, and nonviolent way decided to take a residence in Pyongyang and decide to live there and defend the village along with the actual old uh, farmers who were mostly rice farmers at the time. And then Joyak, that's where Joyak, we met Joyakko when we sent the delegation. And, um, and then later on, after the Pyongyang base was actually started to build and all the villagers had to relocate relocate to the next town and then start anew, he went to um, Gangjong village where there was a, an active struggle, another struggle against the Navy base. 
the Korean government is building. And at the time, it was the port, because of the port size, that although if they said it's a Korean Navy uh, base, that everyone suspected that it's going to be uh, used by the US. And now we, we know after it's built, the US, of course, is using it. So he has been a long time um, you know, a peace activist advocating not only anti-war and against the basis, but also preservation of life, the marine life. So now he had um, hot pink dolphins. Is one of the name of the group that he's promoting, and um, that you know we will be really hearing a lot of fun things, and then also updates from him today. Okay, so please welcome Joy Echo. Thank you for inviting me and having me this opportunity um, where I'm going to be talking about the situation that uh, South Koreans are living on Korean Peninsula every day. It's not just uh, Korean people living, but also some 200,000 American civilians living in South Korea and about 1 million Chinese people living in South Korea too. So if Donald Trump is going to wage a war on Korean Peninsula, somehow there are going to be a whole lot of American civilians and Chinese people killed by his military action. So whenever he makes this dreadful threats against North Korea that if necessary the US is going to totally destroy North Korea it makes us, South Korean people, feel that we are going to die because of his childish action. Because Korea is divided, but on this small peninsula, we live there together. If you bomb that country, South Korean people will die too. People like me will die too. So we are very angry. We are furious against Donald Trump. Because he says all options are on the table. Let me tell you, military options should not be on the table. If you are to friends of South Korea, if you are an ally, then you should never ever think about using military options against Korea. I'm a Korea peace activist and environmental activist. Um, during uh, my speaking tour, I was asked what made you to be a peace activist. I was uh, drafted into the military when I was 19 years old. Uh, South Korea has a compulsory military system and so we don't have any choice. Either you become a conscientious objector to the military service and face 18 months of jail time or you have to become a soldier and becoming a soldier in South Korea means that you have to go through horrible things every day. Well, I became a peace activist because I didn't want anybody to do the same thing that I went through in the military. It was very traumatizing. Well. They uh, taught you, taught you to be a patriot. They tell you to love your country. They tell you to hate communists. Well, I was 19 years old. I don't know who communists were. I didn't know what communism was about. But I was learned to hate those communists and ready to kill those communists.
I was learning discipline, which I hated. Um, later, I realized that patriotism is not about loving your country. It's not about loving the government. The farmers of Pyeongtaek, the small village of Tenchuri, who spend most of their lives growing rice and food, they said to us, one of them actually said to me that to be a patriot, he said, it means to love the land. Um, so uh, later I um, finished the uh, uh, military service, I uh, became a peace activist and, and I started my um, action because Korea, South Korea is one of the most uh, militarized uh, societies in the whole world. Patriarchy is there. Militarism is controlling uh, the uh, everyday lives and um, it's very hierarchical society too. And the military uh, teach you everything that you uh, uh, learn before in the Korean society, but you know, it's like 10 times worse. Um, they uh, say that you have to stand up and, and protect your sister. They say you have to uh, take up arms to protect this country, but later I realized that it means that those uh, young boys were trained to uh, protect the establishment. We were trained to uh, protect the um, ruling class privilege, their rights to uh, oppress most of the people. And so um, I uh, decided to uh, resist against this uh, militarism. And in 2004, South Korean government announced its plan uh, to uh, expand this huge U.S. Uh, military base in Pyeongtaek. They said, we're going to relocate U.S. troops to Pyeongtaek area and so the 500 farmers either voluntarily leave or face forceful eviction. Of course, most of the farmers chose to uh, live in their own community that they lived for hundreds of years. What South Korean government did to kick out those farmers from their own land, their own houses, is to send 20,000 militarized riot cops, the police with riot gear, and soldiers too with guns, into the rice paddies, into the school that we used uh, for peaceful resistance as headquarters of uh, farmers and resistance against the expansion of Camp Humphreys. On May 4th, 2006, finally those huge number of riot police and soldiers came. Five o'clock in the morning, we were ready to defend our land and our village, but we were outnumbered. There were just too many thugs and police and it was incredible. Too many people were injured on that day and the farmers were beat up by the soldiers and police and so um, they finally had to uh, leave and uh, they were forcibly displaced 
by the uh, U.S. military. Why? At the time, the U.S. military set up a new agenda. Its new military policies in Asia Pacific region. At the time, it was called flexible, uh, strategic flexibility. It means that if you are stationed in South Korea, or in the past, before this uh, strategic flexibility, you don't get to leave. You stay in South Korea and defend South Korea. That was their jobs. But now, you have this uh, flexibility, you can go anywhere, according to the U.S. Uh, you know, military plans. Those U.S. troops stationed in South Korea can be dispatched to Iraq. They can be sent to Afghanistan if the U.S. government sees it's necessary. And that's why they started expanding this endless, huge, army base and now it had become even bigger and some say it's the biggest US military base in Asia but we think it's the biggest US uh, military base overseas the size is bigger than some 3500 acres but once you go there it looks much bigger because you cannot see the end and those land that now the U.S. military has built apartment buildings, hangars, airfield, all the infrastructure to wage war in the region used to be those beautiful rice paddies. There was a famous song that we used to sing South Korean people love that song called Sunset because the sunset that you would see standing on the rice paddy was spectacular. I couldn't forget how beautiful it was and now I cannot see it anymore. And the rice paddies turned to be one of the deadliest weapon storages in the world. Um, there are about 800 U.S. military bases in the whole world in 173 countries. 173 countries the U.S. has its military bases. Do you know how many U.S. military bases in South Korea? It's not 38. It's much, much, much more than 38 military bases. Do you know how many? During the 1990s, there was about 150 U.S. military bases. Right now, there are 83 U.S. military bases in South Korea. South Korea is a small country. Think about it, you have 83 U.S. military bases in that country and now we have one more, the THAAD base, well, which is a basically golf course, but pretty soon it will become a new uh, U.S. military base. The villagers uh, in Songju, the south, uh, southern Korea are fighting every day, every day, literally 24 hours, 7, trying to stop any military vehicles or construction vehicles from going to the golf course. The missile launchers are already there, six of them. Each launcher has eight intercepts of missiles, so you can say there are about 48 missiles ready to so-called hit to kill 
Um, but the missiles are not everything. You have this expand radar, this strong radar that can detect any military or civilian activities in China. It has range more than 1,000 kilometers, or even say it can gather sensitive information up to 2,000 kilometers. It's like more than 1,000 miles. So if you put this x band radar in Korea, the U.S. basically can gather sensitive military information from China and some parts of Russia and North Korea. So uh, the people of Sangju resisted and again in September 7th this year, it was less than two months ago, South Korean government and behind it is the U.S. military sent 8,000 militarized police with riot gear and, and they crushed, they removed us with force, they uh, um, beat us, they uh, dragged us out of uh, the roadblock that uh, we tried to stop. Uh, the, yeah, uh, it's sad missile mounted trucks. Um, Jeju Island is famous for its pristine ecosystem. It's so beautiful that uh, whale dolphins live there in the sea. And first time I went there, I was um, fascinated by the beauty of the dolphins and the sea and, and the nature. And so I decided to uh, keep it as it is. Because at the time, the construction of the Jeju Naval Base didn't even start. The villagers of Gangzhen on Jeju Island fought against uh, the commencement of the construction from 2007. The actual construction began in 2011. And it was finished in uh, 2016. At first, South Korean government also announced that we need to have a new naval base on Jeju Island. Nobody understood. Why? Because South Korea has already five naval bases in Busan, in Jinhae, in Mokpo, in Pyeongtaek, in Donghae. We know that. Why do we need another naval base when we have already five? South Korean government says, oh, we need to get ready because the threat from North Korea is there to deter North Korea's uh, you know, threat. Well, look at the map and see where Jeju Island is located. It's located far south, the farthest location from North Korea. And Jeju Island and southern part of Jeju Island is the village of Gangjeong, where the government of South Korea, working with the United States military, built this gigantic naval base. This Jeju naval base is facing South China Sea, and East China Sea. And I don't think South Korean government has enough warships to send to Jeju Naval Base because I know, I live there, I see every day. One third of the time, 
The place is empty. Who is using the Jet Naval Base? The US is using it. In October, about one week ago, this massive scale of South Korea's Navy and US Navy joint military drill was over and some 40 warships participated in the joint drill that took place in the East Sea and the West Sea of Korean Peninsula. 30 U.S. warships came to Korea armed with Aegis missiles and, and every high-tech weapons. One of uh, the battleships came to a Jeju naval base right after the uh, joint uh, drill was over. And so, uh, and it was not the first time. After the completion of Jeju naval base in uh, February of 2016, the U.S. Uh, Navy has sent six warships to there. And the Pacific commander of the U.S. military has openly said that it wants to send its USS Zumwalt to the Jeju Naval Base. Have you heard of the Zumwalt? It's a uh, some 16,000 ton huge combat vessel, but because it has stealth function that it looks like a very, very small fishing vessel on Navy's radar and it's armed with like most deadliest high-tech missiles and, and rail guns and, and it's so expensive. One uh, Zomolt uh, costs up to uh, four billion dollars or five billion dollars and South Korean government says oh yeah we welcome any strategic assets sent from the US because of the North Korea's uh, you know nuclear crisis but the soldiers <laughs> from the U.S., those weapons from the U.S. makes us, South Korean people, feel safer. Do I feel safer? Let me tell you, we don't. And what we see every day on Jeju Island is the U.S. Navy soldiers that we have never seen before. They walk around the neighborhood. Are they our friends? Jeju people get to ask themselves. And what they say is that friends don't come on battleships. If you want to become a true friend of South Korea, then don't even think about attacking North Korea because not only those Korean people will die, people like me will die too. And that's what war is about. South Korean people have relatives, um, grandparents, they are uh, Korean War survivors and they say six million people died during the Korean War. And uh, we have like memories of uh, uh, U.S. Uh, military atrocities against uh, Korean civilians. So during the war, it was not the uh, soldiers who were killed, but many, many, many civilians were killed too. For example, Jeju Island, the massacre uh, started in 1947 and lasted until 1954. The Jeju people fought against the division of Korea, and so they set up People's Committee all over the island and started governing themselves. Uh, but the U.S. didn't want it, and then, you know, there was 
there were uprisings on the island and, and the uh, massacre started. And some 30,000 people of Jeju died during the massacre, according to the official records. But in reality, Jeju people say some 80,000 people died or killed. So to their hearts and eyes, the war has never ended. And, and making this huge naval base on the island of world peace is, you know, U.S. warships and, and U.S. soldiers, it brings the memory of atrocities. And so uh, it's not makes us, it doesn't make us feel safer. And what they do in Korea is escalating the military tensions and making more military bases, sending more troops now that they have these uh, sad missiles that they're supposed to uh, protect South Korea. It doesn't protect South Korea because sad missiles stand for terminal high altitude area defense and South Korea is not a big country. The size is just like New Jersey and so when or if North Korea wants to attack South Korea, the missiles coming from North Korea will not go high enough so that that missile system can shoot the uh, intercept the missiles and hit it in the air. Korean people know that. Um, we just don't have the power to sign the peace treaty with North. I don't know if you know this, but South Korea does not have wartime operational control of its military. U.S. commander has the power to control South Korean military in wartime. And so even though we want the war, even though how much we want to uh, live uh, peacefully with North Korea, the situation does not make us, and, and the U.S. does not give up its uh, ambitions to uh, maintain its uh, dominance in the region. It does not give up its uh, um, greed that they gain from maintaining the situation as it, it is. The U.S. Uh, war manufacturers like Raytheon, that's the uh, maker of the uh, X-Men radar, and Lockheed Martin. South Korean government is uh, importing 40 Lockheed Martin made F-35 fighter jets, and it costs billions of dollars. In 2014, according to U.S. congressional study, um, South Korea is the biggest arms importer in the whole world. In that year alone, South Korea imported some $7.8 billion worth of weapons, and among them, $7 billion are from the U.S. And so South Korea buys whole lot of U.S. weapons and those companies making a lot of money and so they don't want to see the Korean situation solved peacefully. I think that's why Donald Trump is making all the remarks about we are locked and loaded. Um, so uh, when Donald Trump visits South Korea on November 7th. Let me tell you, tens of thousands of people, if not hundreds of thousands of people, will take out to the street, including me, demanding. <laughs> Donald Trump go back and don't even think about using its military, because we know that the U.S. has been aspiring to send more troops to Asia Pacific region. Barack Obama said. The U.S. is sending 60% of its naval might, naval might to uh, Asia Pacific region. That's why they made 
the Tej naval base and the ascending sadness and stuff like that. But just like the people of Jeju has never gave up the peaceful struggle against the Jeju naval base, even though it was completed. Just like the Songju people who are still sitting on the streets, blocking the road, that only road that leads to the entrance of the golf course, will never stop fighting against the militarized situation and we will fight for peace. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Joy, for uh, those insights. Between you and uh, JT, we've gotten a lot of information tonight. Um, and uh, I saw an item on the internet news uh, just before I left home to come here is that uh, our defense secretary, Mattis, is at the DNZ, at the 38th parallel, making warlike no noises and uh, saying that he'll be followed shortly by President Trump, so making warlike noises. So um, your speaking to us tonight couldn't come uh, at a better time. I thought we'd uh, have Q&A uh, for a while, and is and then uh, we've got some, is Reverend Kim in the room? Ah, could, um, after the Q&A, we, we want to announce the action that you have planned, and several other actions that uh, Julian uh, made us aware of. Um, and so we'll, we'll first we'll have uh, Q&A, and um, I guess, uh, do you want me to hand the mic to people, or how do we want to do this? When I teach the Korean War in my class, I talk about the Jeju massacre, and I dramatize it. I said the soldiers, under the control of the U.S. military, lined up the civilians, the peasants from the villages on the island, made them kneel, tied their hands behind their back, poured gasoline on them and set 30,000 people on fire. That's the government that you have, Democrat or Republican. It's fascist, racist, and imperialist. So come November 7th to 25 Broadway, where we will celebrate the Bolshevik Revolution, a 100-year celebration, and fly in the face of the monster that is terrorizing the world who's going to be in Korea threatening more fire and brimstone. We need fire and brimstone against these monsters. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. It was the mili U.S. military officers and U.S. military commanders who are uh, trained uh, then uh, South Korean soldiers who uh, committed okay, the heinous crime of killing 30,000 people or 60,000. It was the U.S. military who uh, uh, supplied the South Korean military with weapons. And, and it was the U.S. military who gave direct orders to kill those so-called communist sympathizers who were just civilians who wanted to live on their island peacefully. And they were just killed by the U.S. military. That's what was the... gasoline from Standard Oil Rockefeller. Yes. Thank you. Others? Oh, Let's see one back there. Um, I know for many years, I, I've been interested very much in the Korean struggle. And it's been very hard to uh, wake people up in this country to how serious it is and the need for solidarity with the Korean people who want reunification and they don't want the U.S. on their backs. And, but I do think there's a change taking place that, especially among younger people, but not exclusively, uh, they're waking up to the significance of this struggle, and, and a lot of it has to do, of course, with Trump's threats. But it's also because the DPRK has stood up to the U.S. and not caved in in any way. And we should take a lesson from that. And I uh, think about how, what we want to say 
to the people in this country if we, as I expect we shall, have more and more people listening to us and be able to mobilize more and more people. Now you can tell from the color of my hair that I've been around for a while. And I was very much involved in the struggle against the war in Vietnam. I was actually on the first demonstration in the U.S. in 1962. And that war, at the beginning, the predominant slogan, you could say, of the war was negotiate now. I didn't agree with that. I know people I was with in Youth Against War and Fascism. We felt it's not up to us to put conditions on a country that's being attacked and oppressed by the United States government. It's up to the Vietnamese people to decide what they want to do. Do they want to have negotiations? Do they feel that they're at the point that they could have fruitful negotiations with the U.S.? That's up to them. What we need to focus on is get the U.S. out. Right. And that's what our demonstrations became. End the war, bring the troops home. And that became the popular slogan. Now this is a different situation now because there aren't U.S. soldiers at this point dying anymore where in Vietnam or, or, or Korea. But still, the costs of what the U.S. is doing and the threat of what the U.S. is doing are growing more and more serious every day. So let's all think, what are we going to say to the people who do come out and won't, don't want to see such a horrible war? How can we influence them to make it clear that the real problem is the U.S., and it's the U.S. that has to get out and back off. Yeah, let Korean people handle Korea matters. We have the knowledge. We have the courage. We have the experience. We have the wisdom. We have the power. We should have the right to decide what to do on Korean affairs. Thank you very much. Leave us alone. <laughs> other other uh, questions? Don't be shy. Comments. Raise your hand. Brother over here. Thank you. Uh, they, reported, they reported the other day that President Trump. We reported the other day that President Trump was able to avoid the draft because he had a phony excuse from his father about having uh, stuff in his heels, which made him physically unable uh, you know, to go with, to be drafted uh, at a time when I, I, I mean, I'm old enough to remember I was drafted during the Korean War. And it was, it was not a voluntary army, it was a draft army. It's only now that you've got a voluntary army. And the guys who go in, to a large extent, go in because they can't find jobs and other reasons. But Trump never went into the army because his father fixed, put the fix on for him to have uh, spurs, it was called, spurs in his knee and his uh, heels. And that was at the time of uh, the Korean War, I'm sure. When I was in the army, and I had no choice but to be drafted. Truman was a Thank you for that comment. Uh, and uh, your comment has caused our main speaker to desire to burst out in song. So he's, he's going to play uh, a song for us now. This song is called Like a Rock. The title is Like a Rock. And Hanjong people love this song because this sacred rock of Colombia was destroyed by the construction of the Jeju naval base. But the people of Kangjong think that the rock is still alive, even though it was blasted by dynamite. And now it's covered with concrete. But in the Deep down their hearts, the rock is still alive, and so it gives them the hope and the strength to keep on going 
their peaceful struggle in front of the Jeju Naval Base main gate every day. If you come to Gangdong Village in Jeju Island, at noon every day, we sing this song and dance together. And so uh, let me sing this one for you. And imagine yourself, you are doing this peaceful human chain around the Jeju Naval Base. The people will never give up until they close down the Navy base and, and convert it into a peace park. And if you know this song, please uh, sing with me. It's all in Korean. <laughs> is for people who you know aren't living in South Korea or who aren't overseas Koreans or people part of Korean diaspora um, but people you know other people in the US um, what are ways that folks can you know actively support 
those um, people over there on the front lines struggling, um, fighting against uh, current occupation and expansion of these military bases. Well, if you can uh, visit Korea, uh, please uh, come to those uh, struggle sites and we can show your support. And one other way is to uh, urge your local government. For example, when this uh, Jeju Naval Base issue was uh, still um, affected, Santa Rosa County in California, if I remember correct, uh, in late 2013, they passed, passed a resolution unanimously that uh, South Korean government should stop the construction of the Jeju Naval Base and the U.S. should stop helping. And Cork City Council in Ireland also passed the same resolution unanimously in January 2014 that the South Korean government should also stop the construction of the Jeju Naval Base. And two weeks ago, Hawaii Council also passed a resolution that this current North Korea's nuclear crisis should be solved peacefully. Hawaiian people urging Trump administration to stop making those threats and, and solve it peacefully. Stop thinking about using military actions. That's what Hawaiian people said to its council. And so Hawaiian council actually passed it unanimously and it helped, the, helped us a lot. And so that's one thing you can do and you can join the protest and say Donald Trump. Yes, as soon as you finish up, forget about it. Okay. Aber, you said there were others? Oh, yeah. Gabe? Hi. Hello, Gabe, I'd just like to make a comment. Thank you very much for your presentation and the early presentation. Um, today, at 12.15, the, I'm an associate member of Vets for Peace, along with Tina, my wife. Is Bob Carl back here? No. Bob Carl back who, Joe, you know, Bob. And Peter Blatson. Peter Blatson set up a meeting with uh, Grace Meng, who is our congressperson. And she had her, her, one of her liaisons talk with us uh, for approximately 20 minutes, 25 minutes. There were four of us on the line. It was a conference call. There were four of us on the line, and each of us, Tina, myself, Bob, and Peter Blatson, you know, gave their feelings and statistics were, were presented. And uh, all, you know, the, the whole idea of it was to put pressure on our congressperson to stand up, you know, I don't want to say to stand up, but to, yeah, to stand up and, <laughs> and really, you know, do, do the best she can, you know, to, to turn this around. We know it's a difficult, uh, an, up street, an, up, uh, an uphill battle with this administration, but the outcome was uh, when we got, got off the conference call, we stayed on the all of us stayed on and discussed. If, if, if we could, if people could do this collectively in, in groups of three or four and, and contact their Congress people and have these meetings, you know, who knows, you know? That's uh, so all I wanted to say. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for coming to uh, New York City and explaining the situation in South Korea and actually the Korean Peninsula as a whole because the Korean people are uni united in some way and uh, while they're separated by a DMZ, um, I know that Koreans care about one another across the border. Uh, one point I'd like to echo with respect to the sister here is how we in the United States could advance the cause. And of course, there are a number of ideas that were put forward. And you also suggested that we go to Korea and go to some of those sites and so forth. Um, I'm going to certainly do that and also advance the effort here in New York City uh, to be a beacon of the United States to oppose war against the Korean people because that is in fact what it is, not just because of uh, questions about North Korea, but in fact the United States 
is in some respects still a colonizer of the uh, Korean Peninsula. So um, I'll say every single day, especially on November 7th, um, we are going to be actively uh, pursuing ways to advance and to follow the uh, struggle of the, in this case, South Korean people uh, for peace and to, I hope, remove the THAAD missiles, which uh, seems very clear that are being imposed on the Korean people. Um, I'd like to see the uh, protests on November 7th, and we could probably even show them on, uh, at our Bolshevik celebration. And I'm just going, and, and I'd like to thank um, uh, IAC for being a very important, in fact, one of the key components of the IAC uh, event uh, in uh, November 7th. So we will broadcast the uh, protests that you have if you send it to us. Thank you very much, and I'll give it to over here. Yes, hi. I'm, uh, I'm John Catalanato. I'm one of the uh, managing editors of the Workers' World newspaper. I wanted to thank the speaker and the other speaker before and the organization tonight for bringing this message. I don't, I don't know how, if you know how important it is, but, but it's certainly important for us, uh, for the workers and the people in the United States to see an organization and someone expressing the opinions of probably what is a majority of the people living in South Korea to want peace, to not want the U.S. to making these kind of threats. This would be an important help also for us in mobilizing the population here. I know that, of course, there's a much larger Korean diaspora living in the United States now than there was in 1950. And uh, it's important, of course, for you to organize amongst the Co Koreans in the United States, but also to get the word out here. And I know that we, uh, Workers' World newspaper, will do its best to publicize your talk tonight and the kind of uh, work that Koreans in the United States are doing to express this opinion so that all the people in the United States know that it's not like the U.S. is helping South Korea against the North. No, they're oppressing all of the people in the peninsula. And we will help get that message out. And again, Kamsamiya, thank you very much for the... I have uh, one more question. And then I want to bring up uh, Reverend Kim, who's got an action that he wants to... Uh, Right here. Right here. I was a U.S. soldier stationed in South Korea in 1980. And you know what happened that year, if not many people in the room do. I was not in Guangzhou. I was actually at Camp Humphreys, which was enormous then. It's much bigger now, as you explained. And I was really horrified when I heard that that was happening because your farmland is not extensive. You have a lot of mountains <laughs> and a small country. The U.S. government doesn't care about anybody except their, their own military and their own arms manufacturers, as it's very clear. I was a sergeant, and our unit was a maintenance unit, not a combat unit. But when things got bad in Guangzhou, we discussed if we would have to hit the streets, we got, we stopped going to the motor pool, we started getting riot training. We had a discussion about if the women would go too, if they came to that, and thank goodness it didn't. But that's as close as I came to combat serving at that time, 1977 to 1981. I'm deeply ashamed of having occupied your country. I'm deeply ashamed that where I was stationed has grown so much and has been so much more oppressive. Thank you so much for telling us what we need to know, giving us an opportunity support, to support you and continue the struggle. I'm very sorry, but the struggle goes on. Uh, I think that I would like you to call on this sister and then we'll go to Reverend Kim. Okay, thank you. I, I actually don't have a question, but I did want to thank you for coming and speaking to us. And I also want to thank you for singing the song because uh, many of us here might al already know that we say that if you can't sing, you're not a Korean. 
And you know, we sing in times of happiness and times of sorrow whenever we're together. And that meant, meant a lot to me. My name is Ayang Che, Che Ayang, and um, I'm a sister with JT. Uh, JT and I were part of a group of 30 women peace activists who crossed the DMZ from North Korea to South Korea in 2015. <laughs> uh, we have not been able to repeat a crossing because of all the security laws that have just fallen in place since then. Uh, but we have each year gone back to the only place we can go, which now uh, has, is called South Korea, and we have walked uh, laterally, uh, horizontally across the southern border of uh, the DMZ and are hoping that uh, circumstances will allow us to make another crossing very soon, uh, this time possibly from South Korea to North Korea, with the intention, for the purpose of opening some doors and some windows where we can meet each other, talk to each other, touch each other, and start little avenues of dialogue. Um, I just wanted to add uh, that we have been working steadily, uh, the Women Cross the MZ group, um, but we are s spread out all over the world and it's very difficult to even have conference calls because some, somebody could be at, you know, at, a, at midnight when we're here in the afternoon. So despite that, we've been uh, working very hard to press for a diplomatic solution uh, to avert war at all times. We've written to uh, the Secretary General, the new one, Antonio Guterres. Uh, we've spoken to members of Congress. We've held um, a couple of uh, conferences down, <coughs> down in D.C., uh, to which you know, you're all welcome to come. Uh, it's an educational thing, but also we just need to voice our concerns. If we don't speak up, nobody will know what is in our minds and we just need more people to become aware of it. So part of uh, what I wanted to let you know is that we have uh, done uh, now four or five webinars and intend to do them at least one, uh, one a month. And they are educational webinars where we invite experts and analysts to talk about the impact of what is going on now and if there is um, uh, any um, uh, anything that we can learn that that we can share, and we see this not as just a Korea Korea issue, but it is a Northeast Asia issue. In fact, if the worst happens, it's a worldwide issue. Um, but um, we thank you all for your concern, and I'm, I'm glad to be here. The worst. I'm sorry, uh, just to give you the website, if you check it out, you will see uh, past webinars that you can check, click on for the YouTube, and you see what you have missed, and also get to know what uh, is coming up. Uh, it's womencrossdmz.org, in one word. Thank you. Yeah, we Thank you. can. Thank you very much. Yeah, forget about the moment. Uh, after some members of uh, the Women Cross DMZ you know, they visited Gangjong village on Jeju Island and we were so moved by it. I think it was the watershed moment uh, in peace movement on Korean Peninsula. You know, we need to cross the DMZ, this borderline, this uh, one of the most uh, heavily fortified areas in the whole world. We have to uh, demilitarize it and I have so much respect for you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Reverend Kim, would you come up uh, uh, there? Because Trump is going to Northeast, is going to Asia, and uh, Korea is on his list of countries to visit, uh, the, the Korean peace movement and the peace movements throughout Asia are mobilizing. There are actions taking place in, on, in LA and Washington, and up until I guess this afternoon, we didn't know what exactly was happening in New York, but Reverend Kim from the uh, church uh, of the um, least of these, I think is associated with the Judson Memorial Church, uh, has some news about something for November 3rd, is that right? Thank you, Mr. Joel, the comment, uh, the, the mention, as mentioned, is uh, 
South Koreans plan the uh, International No Trump Day Relay uh, Solidarity uh, Rally uh, starting in Korea in response to Trump's November visit to Japan, South Korea, and China, and Vietnam, and the Philippines. Uh, so, uh, no Trump Day uh, opposed war angry military intimidation, and, uh, and Trump demand withdrawal of that and U.S. Army and hostile policy toward North Korea and calls for peace on Korean Peninsula and East Asia. So they are uh, South Korean, the big coalition. They ask us and uh, China and Japan and that uh, the uh, Progressive Korean Americans, the, Jap the, the, the Korean in Japan and China, and, and non Korean peace, peace organization in New York, this LA, uh, asked to participate in, in this international No Trump Day rally. Uh, so, I, I, uh, people last, uh, last week I came here to National Lawyer Guild, the press, press, uh, press conference, and some, at the time I asked them to participate, and so I ask you and your com comrade, please join this No Trump Day International Rally uh, in New York next Friday, uh, actually same day with November 4th in South Korea, and, uh, actually Friday, uh, November 3rd, uh, 6 p.m. at Koreatown, uh, Broadway and 32nd Street. And, uh, I'll send the email to uh, uh, Sarah about more detailed information. Uh, Sarah will send you about this information. So, uh, the DC, uh, the LA, November 4th, 6 p.m., and also in LA, Koreatown. And then this year, they will have a, a might be 3 p.m. in front of the White House, the Saturday. But we will have the Friday at 6 p.m. in Korea town. Okay, I'll send you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Reverend Kim. So Friday, November 3rd. Uh, I just want to mention two other things that are happening. Uh, because uh, Julian uh, insisted that uh, we have to be action oriented. So uh, something that you can just get on the web and uh, take and, and act on is this idea that's coming out of the West Coast of Veterans for Peace, namely to, uh, to have a people's peace treaty. This was done uh, during the Vietnam War era, and uh, you can get on, um, you go to Roots Action and write and just put in as your search term, People's Peace Treaty, and it'll come up, and you can sign it there, and we are, uh, so we're trying to gather as many um, signatures for that petition as possible as, as over the next week, week and a half, as Trump uh, goes to Asia. Another item uh, that uh, Joanne called to our attention is that uh, a number of South Korean peace activists have been kept out of the USA, and uh, we want them to have the right to come here, like Joyagol, so they can tell us uh, about struggles over there and what we can do in solidarity with those struggles. For example, on October 25th, 15 South Korean youth activists were denied entry into the U.S. Uh, their delegation, which was called Ban Trump's Crazy Actions. Uh, see, that's what got them in trouble. Right? <laughs> uh, was coming to the U.S. and then they were not allowed on the plane at Incheon International Airport. So uh, I don't have, I have a little bit of information on it, but if you are interested in supporting that uh, struggle to get them, to get free travel into, the, you know, freedom of travel into the U.S. for peace activists, please speak to Julian over here after, um, after the event tonight. So we are going to, uh, Sarah.
Yeah, just before we um, end, because this is an interesting challenge as to what we can do as a next step and at the very time that Trump is making this war visit to Asia. And it's a very dangerous mission. This is not a diplomatic mission. We shouldn't believe that for one minute. Uh, so the action on Friday, if we really want it to succeed, we have to think how to build it actively. And uh, for folks who are here today, if you can stay even a few minutes after the meeting, if you think you can help build, if you can help get the word out, social media, leaflets, calls to others, if you can endorse the organization, uh, the activity. Uh, and also we can make wonderful visuals that bring to life the People's Peace Treaty. I mean, we could have a big board where people sign the Peace Treaty on, on the street, where there's laptops and they can sign online, uh, and where there's material given out. Um, there are a lot of other ideas as to how we make this a real, um, you know, more, more than just a gathering on the street. But we want to show at this time and, and also link it up. Perhaps we can have, um, you know, a streaming, a connection uh, to people um, in South Korea as they're, as they're demonstrating also because it will be happening at about the same time. So let's think on it creatively and if you can gather for even a few minutes afterwards, if you have some ideas, some time, some input you want. Um, and I think there are so many organizations who know this is a time when we have to act together with one voice and it's up to the people in the U.S. Uh, to really speak in complete and total solidarity with all the people of Korea. Okay, that wraps up our program. Thank you all very much for coming out on a Friday night. And uh, you want to get a group photo? Okay, if you're interested in a group photo with our speaker, speakers, uh, please come up. And uh, if you can stay around a few minutes for some brainstorming about the demo that Reverend Kim talked about, please do. Thank yeah, you. If it's not too much of a hassle, please join this uh, taking group photo with us because with the banners here, you can show your support to Korean people. You know, you can show your face so that I can bring the photo and I can, you know, show it to my people. And, you know, they will know that there are tons of American people who oppose the war on Korean Peninsula. And support and, their and, struggle. Yeah, they support peace. Please. Take photos with us. So come on out. Let's come everybody out. come up to the front. No, no, Please. I had a chance to do that. Sorry.